welcome to our continuing educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. And we help manage every aspect of a compliance program and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Rachel V. Rose, JD, MBA, Principal with Rachel V. Rose, Attorney at Law, PLLC, Houston, Texas, and Bruce Linsky, Co-Founder, Director, and Chief Executive Officer at E. Prevenir with us today. Ms. Rose has a unique background, having worked in many different facets of healthcare, securities, and international law and business throughout her career. Her practice focuses on a variety of cybersecurity, healthcare, and securities law issues related to industry compliance and transactional work, as well as representing plaintiffs in Dodd Frank, False Claims Act, whistleblower claims, which remain under seal. Ms. Rose holds an MBA with minors in healthcare and entrepreneurship from Vanderbilt University and a law degree from Stetson University College of Law, where she graduated with various honors, including the National Scribes Award and the William F. Blues Pro Bono Service Award. Ms. Rose is licensed in Texas. Currently, she is the chair of the Federal Bar Association's Government Relations Committee, the co-editor of the American Health Lawyers Association's Enterprise Risk Management Handbook for Healthcare Entities, second edition, as well as the co-author of the books, The ABCs of ACOs, and What Are International Business Considerations? She has been named consecutively to the Texas Bar College, the National Women Trial Lawyer Association's Top 25, and Houstonia Magazine's Top Lawyers for Healthcare. Ms. Rose is an affiliated member with the Baylor College of Medicine's Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, where she teaches bioethics. Bruce Linsky is the co-founder, director, and chief executive officer at ePrevenir. Bruce also co-founded and served as a member of the board of directors at Varen Medical Technologies Incorporated, a provider of 3D navigational systems used in diagnostic or therapeutic applications in the upper respiratory system. Olympus acquired Varen Medical in December 2020 for $340 million. He served as chief marketing officer for Softricity acquired by Microsoft. Top Layer Networks acquired by Corero and Vigilant Networks acquired by Gentech. He was the director of Asia Pac Marketing Operations in Singapore for Bay Network Limited, acquired by Nortel, and as director of industry marketing at Wellfleet Communications, renamed Bay Networks, he received a company wide award for making the greatest contributions to the firm's meteorotic growth. He served as an MBA intern for the Executive Office of the President of the United States and is currently Vice Chairman and Trustee of the Whiten Center, a 100-year-old 501c3 nonprofit health and wellness organization where he also holds the record in the 100-mile swimming club, having swum more than 3,500 miles to date. Bruce holds an MBA from Vanderbilt University and is a member of Beta Gamma Sigma, the National Business Honor Society. He also holds an MS in Electrical Engineering and an MS in Applied Mathematics, both from Georgia Tech, and is a member of Pi Mu Epsilon, the National Mathematics Honor Society. Before we begin, I would like to mention at First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve as a trusted resource for compliance professionals and every month we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja recognition. Today our team is turning the spotlight on Super Ninja Jean Basford, Human Resources Generalist at Maine Nephrology Associates, PA. Jean says, I love working for a medical practice with such a caring staff, both clinical and non-clinical. 
We all work hard to make things run as smoothly as possible so that our providers can give the best possible care to our patients. Congratulations, Jean. Our team is honored to be have to have the privilege of working with you. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit your questions in the question box during the presentation. We'll address questions at the conclusion. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. So Rachel, Bruce, welcome and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Catherine. It's my pleasure to be here today with Bruce Linsky, who not only is a fellow Vanderbilt alumnus, but was also my professor while I attended Vanderbilt. There is no one better situated to have this discussion than Bruce, as you can tell by his extensive background. And we hope that our conversation here today is beneficial for the audience. No presentation would be complete without the requisite disclaimer. The information presented here today is not meant to constitute legal advice. You need to consult an attorney for advice on a specific situation. And the information presented is current as of the date of the original recording. Given the dynamic landscape of both the healthcare and the technology sectors. Participants are encouraged to check relevant government websites as well as other websites for the most updated information. So we um, pulled this quote from an article that was published by MIT and it posed this question. Have you ever noticed that nearly everything in life requires compromise and thus requires some degree of negotiation to get more of what you want and less of what you don't want? Ironically, compromise seems to be something that is lacking overall today, but it's something that is absolutely essential in effective negotiations. Bruce, before we delve into the overview, is there anything you would like to add? Um, no, um, let's get started. I'm happy to be here. Okay, great. So our presentation today is going to focus on the topics which are illustrated on the screen. First, we're going to provide some common healthcare and cybersecurity laws, as well as violation scenarios and situations where negotiations occur in these two industries, which are not mutually exclusive, as we'll see. From there, we'll delve into how to approach negotiations, specifically differences in healthcare and cybersecurity situations, first-hand experiences, and specifically what are some of the important general takeaways as well as some specific tactics and techniques as well as the psychology of negotiations, and then what is the best approach to deal with unreasonable people versus people who are genuine and collaborative and really just want to reach a resolution. And then we'll sum it up with getting to yes and final takeaways, and then we will open the floor to questions. So to begin, we have healthcare to the left of the screen and cybersecurity to the right of the screen. The biggest intersection between healthcare and cybersecurity, not surprisingly, comes in the form of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Now HIPAA passed in August of 1996 and subsequently the privacy rule, what I call the final privacy rule, came into effect in 2002. From there we saw the security rule which was published in the Federal Register in 2003 but became effective in 2005. 
The key differences between the privacy rule and the security rule are that the privacy rule covers all forms of protected health information, whereas the security rule is specific to what's termed electronic protected health information. From there on the HIPAA timeline, we fast forward from that 2005 effective date to 2009. In 2009, we see the passage of the High Tech Act as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. This led to three main areas of interest for people in the healthcare industry or for those individuals, whether they were tech companies or consulting companies, accountants, physicians, finance companies, who did business with healthcare entities. And first, it's the enhanced breach notification rule. Second was the express notion that not only covered entities, which include providers, health insurance companies and claims clearing houses, but also their business associates, meaning those persons that are in privity of contract with the covered entity, and then subcontractors, which are persons in privity of contract with business associates. So you can kind of think of that as a linear line of buckets that these persons fit into. Prior to the High Tech Act, there really was not an express liability per se for business associates or subcontractors, but we began to see rumblings with the High Tech Act. And those rumblings then came to fruition on January 25th of 2013, when the final omnibus rule was published in the Federal Register. And that Federal Register site is 78 Federal Register 5566, and again, it was published on January the 25th of 2013. Subsequently, within the last couple of years, we've seen the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act, which really has an impact on HIPAA and the High Tech Act. We also saw on January 5th of 2021, the passage and signing into law of House Resolution 7898, which in fact, gives entities another safe harbor, if you may, for actually meeting not only the security rule standards, but also the crosswalk standards to the National Institute for Standards and Technology. So in looking at what can happen during a HIPAA breach, I'm fortunate in my practice to do not only the compliance and the cyber risk assessment side of the equation, but I've also brought a variety of different cases, and I represent persons in front of various government agencies, such as HHS, who have received what I call love letters from the Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, that someone has lodged a complaint against them for a potential HIPAA violation. So I've been in the negotiation portion with the patients, I've been in it with the government. Law enforcement often gets involved, especially in ransomware attacks and or other affected parties, including depending where the breach occurred, that covered entity, business associates or subcontractor. Another area uh, or entity that gets involved is typically a cybersecurity insurance company. And for those of you who have ever been in an automobile accident and had to deal with your car insurance company, insurance for cyber is no different and it's a painful experience. So that is one area where we see negotiations come into play in healthcare. Another is during a False Claims Act case. And typically what happens here is the relator or the whistleblower's counsel will negotiate either with the government and or opposing counsel on a case. HHS OIG investigations for, among other things, anti-kickback statute violations. For those of you who are new to healthcare, the anti-kickback statute was promulgated in 1972. 
It is literally one of the top laws under fraud, waste, and abuse laws that the government prosecutes both civilly and criminally. It is a statute which has both criminal and civil components and violations of kickbacks, meaning that a person is paid either in cash or in kind for referrals or product or service utilization by a federal program or a federal program beneficiary is in fact subject to the anti-kickback statute. It is a law that it's oftentimes used in conjunction with a False Claims Act case. So here during these negotiations, if it's not part of a False Claims Act case, normally the lawyer and the individual is negotiating directly with the government. Now, private equity deals are an area where Bruce has a lot of experience, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of negotiations that go on in private equity, especially now as we've seen an uptick in private equity integrating themselves into healthcare. There's also a lot of considerations because of the number of different players in private equity deals as well. Mergers and acquisitions is another area where negotiations take place. Private uh, practice purchases or physician investments. This raises stark and anti-kickback laws, and this is an area of negotiation when you're looking at physician contracts that you need to make sure that your lawyer is very well versed in, as well as having a third-party valuation expert who understands healthcare inside and out. And finally, group purchasing organization contracts, or if you're in the pharmaceutical industry, you would be negotiating with health insurers, pharmacy benefit managers, and the like in order to get certain drugs and bio items onto their formulary. Bruce, before I transition to cybersecurity, is there anything you would like to add to the healthcare side of the equation? Yes, um, I'd love to. Um, I'm going to um, run down your list here that you just covered so well. Um, with the HIPAA breach, um, my commentary uh, on this is the following. Um, we know how frequent these are. Um, I, I get the healthcare industry newsletters and, you know, they're occurring every week in provider institutions, you know, within the healthcare industry. On a different topic regarding HIPAA, I'm in the, um, the company I run is a digital health company. Digital health is a very new area in the healthcare industry. And something that is crystal clear, I come from the high tech industry and you know I'm crossed over into healthcare, is there will be a um, modification or relaxation of the HIPAA requirements in order to take advantage of digital health. Uh, digital health, is good for productivity, and it's even better for raising the quality of care. And um, here in the US, I think we're all aware that we have the most expensive healthcare on the planet, you know, when measured per capita, and the quality of healthcare in the US is actually below average compared to other developed countries. So there is a wide um, room for improvement in healthcare, which is why I think digital health, the emergence of digital health will force, you know, a revision of the current HIPAA definition. Down in the private equity deal, um, this is a fascinating area in healthcare because it plays in a lot of different facets of the healthcare industry. The obvious one and the most visible one is you know we're all aware of private equity um, firms um, buying out you know different operations. They um, they can buy out hospitals, they can buy out um, healthcare industry players um, such as medical device companies or um, pharma companies or portions of those companies. Companies are always spinning off you know businesses that they. Um, no longer have an interest in or don't feel are core to their objectives. For example, BD um, just announced two weeks ago that they're spinning off their diabetes business. 
I am aware that Medtronic is considering the same thing. Um, so those are typically picked up by private equity firms. What's even more interesting, though, with private equity and healthcare is that some of the key suppliers to healthcare, specifically pharmaceutical firms and medical device firms, um, have been using or are beginning to use private equity firms to actually share the risk of new products or new drug um, development. Um, so private equity is getting to play in a very interesting area um, in the supply chain to the healthcare industry. Uh, let's see. Back to HIPAA. Um, HIPAA is a fascinating area. Um, a couple of observations I've made, you know, in my seat, you know, as a CEO of this startup company, um, we're dealing with a lot of different countries, not just the U.S., and we're very early, you know, in the market. Um, one of the reasons for doing that is we, we saw very early on that there are other healthcare markets that are more advanced than the U.S. Um, in the sense that they're more cutting edge. The system, of course, is more efficient. That's not hard um, compared to the U.S. So our, our attention isn't just on the U.S. But um, back to HIPAA, a fascinating aspect of this is um, the country of Australia, which has a single payer system, but the single payer system in Australia is just a base. Um, in the U.S., you could picture it almost as the equivalent of Medicaid, um, except it's for everyone. Um, so everyone in Australia gets basic medical care, and that's complemented by um, quite an efficient private health care insurance industry. So the typical Australian has insurance, you know, from a private provider, and they also have their, what they, they call it Medicare in Australia, but it's equivalent to our Medicaid, with the exception that it's not just intended for um, the lower social economic classes, it's for everyone. But um, back in 2016, um, I participated in this because uh, it was a series of webinars in Australia. As Australia rolled out their new digital um, electronic health record system, good for them. But the most interesting thing about it is this system, though it is created by the government, is owned by the patients. You know, so if I am a person in Australia, I am the one who has primary access to my EHR. If I'm dealing with a physician, um, I grant that physician access to my EHR and can restrict the physician as to what he can see, you know, within my EHR, depending on you know, what the transaction is I'm having with that physician. Um, the same goes for hospitals. Um, so the HIPAA um, in Australia is patient focused. And when I say patient focused, you understand what I just said. The patient owns and runs the EHR. It also makes the patient highly portable. You know, so the, if the patient is going to switch physicians, which is commonplace in Australia. Uh, the, the notion of a primary care provider or a personal physician has less strength, you know, in, in healthcare in Australia. Um, it's more of an open market. So if I can get a better deal here with this physician or I like that particular physician, I give them, yeah, I make the appointment and give them access to my EHR. Um, in the US, you understand that the way the EHR systems are set up, they kind of serve as anchors, you know, holding the patient to a particular healthcare system. EHRs are not very um, compatible yet here in the US. So um, that's about it on this, this list, Rachel. Okay, perfect. Bruce, you raised a couple of great points with HIPAA, and I mentioned the 21st Century Cures Act, and last May there were two final rules which were published, one by ONC, the other by CMS, and recently the information blocking provisions came into play. One of the main drivers behind 
the 21st Century Cures Act, as well as what we now know is coming down the pike, the proposed changes to the privacy rule and HHS just closed the comment period on May the 6th for that. But basically it is to get the patients access to their own health information increased. Also, it improves information sharing for care coordination and case management for individuals and facilitates greater family and caregiver involvement. One item that I've seen remain constant in a variety of different countries and in the US is that while there is this integration, one area that cannot be compromised is the security component because if an individual has a vulnerability, that could then lead to the entire system being breached. And from what I've seen in the information blocking and for a good example is the general rule for the 21st Century Cures Act final rules is that a patient may request that their PHI or medical record be transferred to any app, to any end placement that they want. The counter to that and really the stopgap safety measure, and I actually had a conversation with HHS about this, is the practice or the hospital has an obligation not only to that patient to make sure that they can get their information, but they have a duty to protect their entire IT infrastructure. And if someone says, I want my data transferred to TikTok, well, that runs afoul of the security rule and could potentially open the door for a cyber criminal to come in through an app that is not valid. So all things considered, I think it's that balance of integration with making sure that you're not opening the barn door to the ransomware attacks. Can I add something, Rachel? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so I'm going to put my high tech hat back on here. Um, the, the situation you just described, you know, with um, the apps is key. And um, it's a big trapdoor, you know, for, for um, security violations and entries into um, healthcare systems. That, that is going to be very challenging um, to solve, you know, in view of the latest um, privacy um, update that you described. It is probably going to require um, a revision of the architecture, you know, of the IT system, you know, within the healthcare um, organizations um, to actually have um, a, an external environment. Um, by that, I mean an environment for such, for such applications, you know, that want to use the EHR. Um, and a very solid wall blocking that external environment from the internal environment to prevent, you know, to make it physically impossible for there to be an entry in that case. That, that is going to raise the security very much. It's also going to make some other things, though, inconvenient, you know, for the healthcare organization. I think one issue, too, Bruce, to consider on that, I concur with you is that, as you know, we have major health systems who have the resources to do that, but for smaller physician practices, that's probably a lot larger hurdle to overcome. The other item, for example, I'm a patient at Cleveland Clinic, so I have access to my chart through Cleveland Clinic. In terms of liability under HIPAA, if a an entity such as Cleveland Clinic or a lot of the major health systems contracts with a business associate to develop a my chart type scenario if there's a breach then Cleveland Clinic is potentially liable because that is where they direct their patients to go to get their health information and to communicate with their providers versus if you don't have you being a health care entity, that type of setup, then the requirement, as long as it's safe to the system, and even during COVID, 
HHS and CMS issue guidance for telehealth saying you're not to use outward facing types of applications such as the open Facebook environment, TikTok, or Skype that is outward facing. Internal with the appropriate privacy controls was fine. So I think it's gonna be on a case by case basis, but what you said makes sense for a larger entity to do if they don't have their own system. And, and what you pointed out, Rachel, for the smaller entities like physician practices, um, that that's going to create a new market opportunity for service providers. So there will be companies that step into that space to fill that need for smaller practices because in our healthcare system, you know, there are still thousands and thousands of those. Um, so there is an attractive market there. But in this case, you know, if a third party service provider arises to take care of that need for the smaller organizations, they're creating the situation you've described a few times where the liability, you know, is now shared. Right, exactly. And so, from your tech side, I think that's invaluable. And I agree that when, where there are obstacles, there are opportunities. And it's just making sure, from my perspective, and I would love your perspective, that whatever the company is, that they have are able to take advantage of economies of scale so that the smaller providers can still meet the requirements. Oh, yes, very much so. You know, so it will be, it will be a purchased service, you know, for the smaller providers, you know, and they will um, buy this service from these third party providers um, who take care of the, those security issues. Um, nevertheless, you know, again, the liability is going to be shared in that case. Absolutely. So along the lines, I know we hit on some of these with cybersecurity and you brought up the international regulations. One item that I really want to point out, because this is a significant area of potential liability, is in fact negotiating with the cyber criminal directly. And the reason that is, is because the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is part of the U.S. Department of the Treasury, issued two bulletins in the fall of 2020. And it's incumbent that people appreciate that you don't always know who was on the back end or who that cyber criminal is. They could in fact be a state actor, which is precluded um, from doing business with the United States, including United States citizens. So if you transfer money to a state actor, which is on what I always refer to as the do not disturb list, right, or the prohibited ineligible list to do business, you could in fact be criminally liable, which makes it imperative during any ransomware attack, you always want to reach out to the FBI, there is a link on their website for these types of attacks. And also, if you're in healthcare, you want to reach out to OCR and report, or you want to reach out to the Department of Defense, for example, to get them involved, because there are provisions in the laws, whether it's HIPAA or other relevant cybersecurity laws, that say the government can direct you not to provide external notice either to the media or to the patients while they're conducting their investigation. So you might not have to meet, for example, that 60 day time frame to notify patients, but you have to coordinate with the government in order to do that. Bruce, anything there before we go to the next slide? Um, yeah, um, I wanna ask you a question. Um, what's at the top of my mind here with the ransomware attack is the recent event with the colonial gas pipeline you know so so e even though you know that's not the healthcare industry it's interesting with this topic because it appears at least with the public um information it appears that they dealt directly you know with the cyber criminal um who we have learned you know is an organization that is based in russia we don't know what the connection of that organization is to the Russian government, but um, it it seems it, in the public news, it seems as if Colonial acted immediately on their own and paid the ransom. 
That's exactly right. And whenever I've read the articles, as you know, we don't often know what the total situation right. is. And I'm just targeting back, Bruce, to when I was in business school. And as you know, we had to do that crisis management situation where we came in, we were given a scenario, one person is the individual who converses with the media, and there's a lot going on behind the scenes. It could be that the Colonial Pipeline did in fact contact the FBI, and the FBI was involved because the greater catch here would be to back into who conducted the attack, and you need very sophisticated people and technology to do that. So it could have been that the government didn't want the cyber criminals to know that they were involved with the process. And so the play was that Colonial Pipeline negotiated with these individuals directly with the government's blessing. We don't know because that wasn't set forth. The other scenario is just what you described, and that was Colonial went rogue, which I would never advise any client, regardless of the size, to do. And having represented clients who had international uh, attacks on their systems and ransomware issues related to that, there's no way in my personal dealings that an individual should ever deal directly with a ransomware person. Right. Um, and on on this topic um, with cybersecurity, and you know, we're speaking about ransomware in particular, what what you always have to look at is both sides. You know, thus far we talked about the cyber criminal, so the actual attack. Um, but you have to look at the opposite side. So how were they able to be attacked? You know, and in, in the case, in the example we're using with Colonial Gas, but um, they, they were using some very outdated software, yeah. you know, on their system. And believe me, um, that is often the case back in healthcare, you know, because um, from, uh, this is the experience I have. I, in my, my original background and most of my career was in the high tech industry. So um, even though now I'm in the healthcare area with this digital health play, um, when I'm dealing with any healthcare organization, typically they're healthcare systems, large healthcare systems that I'm dealing with. Um, you can't help just because of the way I'm wired. You know, you have that bias. Um, so you're paying a lot of attention to how their IT system works and what standards they have set up to protect themselves um, because our the product we have is going to interface tightly with the EHR so we have to get into that stuff you know with the IT department of the healthcare organization and um, it is scary to me um, to see what's there um, it's typically dated infrastructure and software, you know, e e even in these gigantic healthcare organizations, they um, they have trouble keeping up, you know, with the best practices with the IT. And the reason for that is picture a healthcare system or even a hospital, you know, same is true in a hospital. You have a budget, you know, you know how much you have to um, give to the providers, you know, within the system. Uh, you are worried about the quality of care. You have to keep that up. You, there are so many things you have to worry about. And then one of those other things that doesn't produce revenue is called information technology. You know, so they are often on the short end of the deal, you know, in getting enough budget to do what they should be doing. When you learn about these, and they happen every week, multiple ones, you know, in the healthcare sector, if you learn more information about it over time, you realize, you know, it was just a crazy vulnerability that anyone in his right mind would never have allowed. Bruce, you raise an excellent point. And stemming back to 2014, when community health systems had their attack, sure, it was a, a country actor from China, but what they neglected to do as a major 
multi-billion dollar healthcare system was implement the patches. It's so simple, right? I do it when I update my computer every night, right? Or every week when they send me the patch updates. There are certain things that to your point are so simple. And in February of 2020, Law 360 published an interview with then OCR director, Roger uh, Severino, and he identified what's known as low hanging fruit. And even in my presentations and with my own clients, the five main areas of low hanging fruit in terms of HIPAA compliance are first, not conducting that annual risk analysis where you identify all of the deficiencies that you talked about. And some are not that expensive to fix. It's just laziness or lack of oversight or the board not understanding the relevance and the potential liability, financial liability and reputational liability in the event of a cyber attack. The other item was adequate policies and procedures. Next was annual training. From there, they went on to state making sure that adequate business associates are in place. And you're correct since business is global and a lot of healthcare entities have clients around the world, it's imperative that whenever you draft a business associate agreement, that you take into consideration what the other countries laws are as well. And then the last item is encrypting the data both at rest and in transit and making sure that there are no vulnerabilities. So part of the risk analysis is to have a penetration test done by a knowledgeable and reputable third party so that they can help identify some of those outside vulnerabilities as well. Right. And let me add to that, um, Rachel. Um, in my view, um, I have, I did have a company in the um, security industry and in high tech um, that was uh, developing intrusion detection um, software, and that was way back um, mm -hmm. in the late 1990s. And at that point, cybersecurity was entirely reactive. You know, so the first time anyone ever heard the word was after the breach occurred in the company. You know, so uh, there was no prevention focus whatsoever. Uh, you know, uh, two decades later, there is more of a prevention focus. Um, you just cited, you know, the great checklist organizations need to go through that such a list exists is progress, you know, in the industry because it didn't exist in the 90s. But the lowest hanging fruit on the tree you you glanced off of it, and that is um, procedures, you know, internal procedures and regulations. I'm going to put in another word. The word is employee. Yeah. Uh, because that's the biggest open door, you know, for any um, nefarious external party. There's always an employee in that organization who's very easy to trick. No, you're exactly right. So that goes back to the training aspect and focusing on social engineering. So not only fishing, but cat fishing, spear fishing, whale fishing, right? Vishing, which is the voice type of fishing and other techniques that cyber criminals use. The other aspect that I think really is becoming more and more crucial is making sure that and it's expressly stated in HIPAA, but you need to make sure that you are vetting your workforce members and doing those criminal background checks. Bruce, you've been in high tech and in healthcare. Could you imagine hiring someone who has a criminal record for identity theft and served 10 years in prison? Um, it, it happens. And um, it's it's back again to the situation of how much how much are you going to spend to prevent that from happening? In other words, is every single employee that you hire for any position in the organization going to be subject to a full background check? That's the case in some organizations, but that the number of organizations is in the minority. 
Right. And for those organizations that do, sure, you can get someone on the cheap, right, who's just out of prison for identity theft. But why would you hire them in an industry like cyber or finance or healthcare? Uh, you wouldn't. You know, you have you have a clash here. You have a clash of the risk and, you know, what certain industries need, you know, and require versus the um, interest in giving giving people a second chance. Right. And I concur. I think there are different ways to give people second chances, but that's definitely not one. So now that we've laid the background of the laws and considerations there, we obviously discussed uh, a lot of different scenarios where negotiating where negotiations can arise. So on this side, Bruce, I just would like for you to delve into each bucket, beginning with the psychology of negotiations and what you found to be effective in approaching. Um, all right. I'm going, is it okay if I flip the first two boxes? Absolutely. The uh, floor right. is Yeah, because, um, the preparation is mandatory, you know, no matter what the issue is that you're negotiating. And, um, you know, this, this isn't necessarily for a formal negotiation, you know, for a big deal. Um, you're always negotiating, as Rachel made clear, you know, at the beginning with that quote, you know, on the slide. But preparation is mandatory. And the preparation um, involves um, two different facets. Um, number one is internal. So uh, you're negotiating for something. Um, a thorough understanding of what the base is on whatever you're negotiating for. What would you end up settling for as the minimum acceptable um, base? Um, a clear understanding of that. In addition to that, um, it is good now, I, I happen to be a um, quantitative type person. So um, in addition to understanding what the base is, I also have um, probably two other levels, you know, above the base. You know, like this this would be good. The second one would be very good. Um, the, the, the first, getting everything would be ideal. You know, so I just have it um, marked, you know, demarcated in my head. So... I know, you know, in the process, whether I'm ascending, you know, in that in that schematic or whether I'm descending. Um, if I'm descending, I'm going to be um, fighting harder and harder um, to prevent any more descent. In addition to that, um, so so that's the view internally. Now, the external view, if you know with whom you're going to be negotiating. Um, I always find, um, if that's the case, I want to know everything about them, you know, that I can possibly know, especially if it's a big deal, you know, that's going to be negotiated, you know, so I'm going to research them. Um, the first place I'm going to look is on LinkedIn, you know, to just read their profile. Um, I do this so much that um, even though a profile, you know, two different profiles may have the same components to them, because um, that's up to the user, you know, to decide what to include. Even though they have the same components to them, you just have been doing it so often, you notice certain things. You notice that, you know, this person is one who jumps from position to position, you know, within an organization or among organizations. And that that gives you a certain view, you know, of what this person is like. Um, what if they have um, activities outside of business that they chose to list, organizations they participate in? I pay a lot of attention to that. So I'm just I just have the need, you know, to know something. So I'm I'm creating this profile, you know, of this person who's going to be sitting on the other side of the table from me. Um, and that just gives, I could be completely wrong, you know, but more often than not, I'm mostly right. And it just gives me 
a bit more security, you know, walking into the situation. So the preparation you make is internal and external, if you can do that. If, certainly you can do the internal. You should know everything you need to know about why you're doing this um, and what you're willing to settle for. This is also important. Um, if you look at the external party you're going to be negotiating with, um, the item you're going to negotiate, let's call it X, okay? So you have to have a very firm understanding who is X more valuable for, you know, between the two of you. And don't ever forget that um, because that tells you, if you really understand that, that tells you who's going into this negotiation with the advantage. And that's important. So with the psychology, if I move on to that, um, this is something you might not be able to um, learn, you know, from your preparation. Um, you'll learn a lot, but um, once you start dealing with the person, you'll understand, you know, what game, you know, the person is trying to play, you know, in the negotiation. And my... Uh, there there are um, reasonable people and there are unreasonable people. Um, there are two buckets, you know, these people fit into. Uh, so if you're dealing with an unreasonable person, um, you, and it's happened a number of times, um, you're, you just, your expectation is set immediately. Anything can happen in this you know, including um, the person I'm negotiating with could lose their temper, um, could try to use that tactic. They could actually lose their temper, but they could intentionally lose it to try and use that tactic with me. Um, they could be quiet and appearing uncooperative, you know, so they're causing me to do most of the talking. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing unless you're pulling them your way. Um, they could walk away. You know, they could, you know, just give up, you know, and walk out of the room. Um, so you need to, um, when you meet the person, if you don't know them in advance, and the negotiation begins, um, there are two different things happening here, at least. You know, number one is the content, you know, of the negotiation is starting to play out. Um, but number two, at the same time, you, you are multitasking because you are very rapidly trying to pigeonhole this person into whatever those categories are you have in your head, you know, for um, people who negotiate, you know, the four, five, six, seven different categories. You just try and match them to one so you have a handle, you know, that you can grab onto you know, for the negotiation. So a lot's going on initially. If you have a reasonable person at the other end of the negotiation, um, these are these are the ones you like to do, you know, and unfortunately, you know, they're probably at most 50%, you know, of the negotiation. I find with a reasonable person, I am aware in advance of, you know, this negotiation is of greater value to which of the two of you, you know, you or the other. Um, and you just um, play it that way. And what I try to do is let the other party always believe that they're gaining ground, you know, so you, I, I come across as very agreeable. You know, not, I am absolutely not the kind of person who objects to, you know, everything in a negotiation. I try to agree with, you know, everything I can. And at the same time, I am kind of like slow, gently pulling the carpet out, you know, from under them. So I'm, I'm trying to be very subtle. Common negotiating tactics. Um, typically, a, that's what Rachel has up here right now. Um, Typically, you figure that out 
you know, this is part of the initial impression you're getting, you know, of the person sitting on the other side of the table. It has to do with the psychology. So you are trying in your head to map this person as fast as you can, you know, into whatever categories you have created and live with for negotiation. And um, once you think you have them successfully mapped, and I hope they are, um, then you start using, you know, picking the pro what you think are the proper tactics for this type of person. So uh, you have, you know, Rachel, do you want to go run through these? Sure, Bruce. And using that as a segue into these different types of negotiation tactics, in my experience, and to your point earlier, Oftentimes you get a good sense of someone who wants to negotiate but isn't willing, for example, to pay the amount that's due on a contract, but they're reasonable. And so my approach is first, I'm gonna jump to lack of authority. You always wanna make sure that you're dealing with the person who has authority to make the decision because otherwise you might reach an agreement, waste a lot of time and a lot of money, but then they have to take it back. And so you want to make sure that they are the person that you need to be dealing with up front. Another tactic, the good cop, bad cop, I'll frame this in a different light. Oftentimes, I know in your negotiations, you've had more than one person on each side. And as a female, whether it's a cultural issue, whether it is an age issue, whether it is, to your point, the way someone was potentially raised, I oftentimes bring in a male counterpoint for more than one reason. And my counterpart and I are very complementary to each other. And we find out very quickly who is being responded to more and my nature, as you know, is typically more collaborative and conversational. So if I'm in a room with unreasonable people, typically my counterpart will be the one who becomes more assertive, is the male, and doesn't come across in a different vein just because he is not a female. Yeah, can I say something about this one? This is, this is a fascinating one. Um, it happens a lot. Um, if you know, if you're studying, you know, if you're um, literate in negotiation, you recognize, you know, this situation um, when it presents itself. So you're, you're absolutely right. There's typically um, two or more people involved on both sides of this. So it's a collaboration within the organization, you know, on both sides. And um, there, there are some features, you know, of desired features of the negotiation that are easier to negotiate, and there are others, you know, that are quite difficult to negotiate and are going to be very distasteful, you know, to the opposite side. And having having a good cop bad cop set up is brilliant, you know, on on your own side. So that there is a person there who pretty much is playing the role of the bad cop, you know, dealing with the unpleasant things, you know, in the negotiation. And it's perfectly all right for the other side to hate this person, you know, to end up hating this person, you know, and dislike them. But the important point is you get you end up with most of what you want. And it would have that would not have been possible likely with a single negotiator. Absolutely, I concur 100% on that. And that really goes into what you laid the foundation for with your earlier comments on whenever you approach something, I think this ties into the reasonableness of a party. The two most common tactics I've seen up front are high ball, low ball, or extreme positioning. So one person says $100, the other person says a million dollars, but typically you meet in the middle, or it's actually statistically the person who throughout the high ball offer ends up slightly ahead on that front. And then there's another position called anchoring, where, and I see this a lot in some of the contract disputes I deal with, there's been some, issues on both sides and I'll say what number are you comfortable with or give me something reasonable and they'll pretty much hit around the middle 
And so both sides kind of anchor. And then from my perspective, it's really the nibbles or the small concessions that aren't necessarily monetary that really play very nicely as a compliment or a side dish, if you will, with an anchored position. Yeah, very much, um, very much. And then one of the items, at least on the snow job side that I do, anytime I just see mounds of paper or uh, we know what's coming, right? I always just remind myself and my client, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And I think, Bruce, you're a distance swimmer. I run half marathons and I'm more of an endurance athlete as well. I think when you have been in endurance sports, you're able to enter that mindset of, okay, I need to approach this step by step, right? And once I get to 100 yards and swimming out of a 500, I'm 20% done. Yeah. In other words, you're going to break this down into bits, you know, and you're going to frame it, you know, for the person on the other side who's dumping too much information um, so that you do it step by step or bit by bit. Right. And so the last two items on here, deadlines. Now, from my perspective, typically people reach an agreement. And if you have the people who are able to make authority, then things are pretty much drafted up and done within 48 hours of the framework, just so the final contract can be reviewed. Is that your typical very much. Um, very, very important point. Um, the deadlines um, is you want, you know, so you so you get to the end of the verbal, you know, negotiation going through the act or the back and forth, you know, if you're doing it um, long distance. Um, you want to set a date. OK, so when will I have this? What you never want to do is let it hang. You want to set that date in as close as you possibly can, like 48 hours, 24 hours, you know, but nothing more. Because as soon as it's allowed to lag, um, that is when the opportunity occurs for the nego for what was negotiated to change. Right. And I think that then leads us into the brink, right? As you said, unreasonable people may throw this out within 10 minutes, right? I'm leaving, take it or leave it, blah, blah, blah. And they use a lot of puffery and oftentimes they're bullies as well. And I think to your point, that's where the bad cop or someone who can counter that kind of smack them in the mouth, so to speak, and take back control. That's one way to do it. But it's also, I think, effective regardless of your negotiating style. If you think you're being played or it's just been a long day and you say, you know what, this is our final offer. And to your point, the walk away, you have to be willing to walk away. Yeah. Yes. You, you, that's part of your preparation, you know, in advance of the negotiation is understand um, when you can walk away before yeah. you start. And I will say in negotiating with the government, that's a very different situation than negotiating in a business scenario. And I'm not a criminal lawyer, but having had conversations with my criminal colleagues or having been involved in cases that have a criminal component to it, you always don't have the, you know, take it or leave it option. And so I think, again, it depends on the facts and circumstances and the environment in which you're dealing with the negotiation. Yeah, you're right. Um, as far as the government goes, um, I personally dread, you know, having any, any interaction whatsoever with the government. And it's primarily because of that. You know, it's a, it's a take it or leave it situation. The government has no competition. Right, exactly. And that's when, I, for me, as I said, I'm not a criminal counsel. There are things that criminal lawyers do that I don't even know how they do what they do, but the negotiation and the dance that goes on in criminal cases is a completely different deal. But I raise that because the healthcare laws, the healthcare fraud, and even cyber 
attacks or the theft of PHI, you're into the criminal arena with that. Yes. So additional considerations. I know you gave an excellent, uh, two excellent examples of different cultures with Asia being a very significant example. What about the macro landscape? For example, if you're in negotiations during the pandemic, how did that alter some of your negotiations, Bruce? Um, believe it or not, the pandemic had very little effect on anything. Um, huh. Uh, you know, there were a few organizations or entities that certainly were um, distracted, you know, so it was better for us to move on, you know, because of the pandemic and not wait for them. But um, I, other than that, um, I didn't find, you know, any problems whatsoever. In fact, the um, rise of Zoom, you know, because of the pandemic, well, lots of negotiations took place over Zoom and it worked great. You know, I think um, I think much more will happen, you know, as a result of that. Absolutely. I've, I found in my own negotiations that while Zoom was convenient in some ways, there were still situations that I would have preferred to be in person because I still think something is missed on Zoom. Yeah, for sure. You're missing the body language, um, you know, which can be a very key component. However, um, what um, what was Zoom was good for was when you realize that in order to progress in the negotiation, this is going to be a good cop, bad cop, you know, set up. So you pull someone else, you know, into the meeting and they become the bad cop and it works beautifully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's perfect. One common technique that I've heard you intimate before, which really is almost like a Venn diagram of preparation and technique. It's almost like using a SWOT analysis before you go in. So your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But you've talked about the trap door. Would you explain that a little bit more for the participants? Um, yeah, the, the trap door is, um, I refer to it as a topic in the negotiation you're aware of, you're, you know, if you did your preparation, you're, you really should be aware of these trap doors in advance. And they stand for any topic you really don't want to get into, you know, and drag into the negotiation. Essentially, things you want to avoid at all costs, if possible, because it can contort the entire negotiation and change the thrust of it. Right. And it, from the legal side, one item that I'm constantly forced to look at and any legal counsel should relate to their own client is what's your liability in this mix, right? Sure, they're saying, you're saying this occurred on their side, but what culpability do you have from a legal standpoint? Yes, this is, that's what I call part of the value proposition of the negotiation. And that is, Knowing in advance, and you really should, there's no reason not to if you've done your homework. If, um, who gets the highest value out of this, you know, out of the outcome? And that's critical. We are, you know, in, in the company I lead right now, um, we're tiny. Um, you know, we're a tiny company. We have some um, valuable intellectual property that we're creating and what is remarkable to me is how we are able to get the biggest players in the industry to the table very easily and we know that now because we know with certain players what we have is of more value to them you know than it is to the market the general market Right. 
Exactly. And then dealing with dishonest people, I'll admit, this is when I always bring in other individuals because you can't deal with unreasonable, irrational, or people who just blatantly lie. <laughs> right. And to your point earlier, Bruce, aside from bringing in another person, what's the best way to deal with dishonest people? This is this is the hardest one, Rachel. Um, it, it it happens, you know, it happens too often. Um, the the problem with these people is that you know whatever you decide isn't necessarily going to stick, you know, af after all that because they they're just naturally dishonest. The um, this is a walk away situation. Um, and if it isn't that, it's absolutely a good cop, bad cop situation. And what you're trying to do is um, a lot of times you have no um, resort except to go for the absolute base and get out of this as fast as possible. Right. And so in law what happens and i know in your level of business it happens you then deal with people who don't want to keep it behind closed doors but they will file a lawsuit full of false <laughs> right statements yeah. and so that i think has another component to it because these people are irrational on top of being quite frankly liars right so now you have to deal with the reputational fallout my perspective is that it's really, like you said, they're the hardest people to deal with, but getting things resolved and making them look like the liars that they are sometimes might require a judge. Correct. Um, it is, the, it is the, um, it, this happens a lot. It doesn't have, it's happened to me. Um, it doesn't happen to me a lot. Um, but I, you see, you see this situation happen a lot publicly. Exactly, exactly. So then taking all of those factors, I'm sure you're familiar with the book, Getting to Yes, and many of our participants may be as well. I found these to be some key takeaways. So what's your best method or approach to separate the person from the problem in other words take the emotion out of it absolutely um that's rule number you know near the top you know for negotiation you automatically will have an advantage if you're walking into a negotiation and you are strictly business um so any emotion you know is wiped clean um and you try to deal with the person, no matter what type of person they are, you know, the other side of the table, strictly from the business standpoint. You know, so that that requires a lot of discipline. It's usually a, the optimum path to follow. Right. And so that segues into what you said earlier, focusing on the interest, knowing what your game plan is. Manage the position and not the person I think you have to do both. You do. You, you, um, it is impossible for you not to understand who the other person is, you know, that you're dealing with. You know, I talked a lot about that, you know, and just trying to map this person, you know, into the various types. Um, so it's impossible not to know that. Um, but stick to the position. What you, what you, um, what this is trying to say, this bullet is don't ever step out even for a minute, you know, of the um, business and the position and say or do something that is personal. So Got in it. other words, yeah, you're, you're appreciating who the other person is, but, um, <laughs> and their qualities and so forth. You know, but this is essentially saying stick to the business and just assume you're dealing with an inanimate object. Got it. Uh, kind of like a cat on Zoom, right? Correct. Uh, express appreciation. To me, that's what I heard you saying early on that you do in order to kind of whittle the rug out slowly. 
you expect appreciation, and but this this harks back to the previous bullet. When you expect appreciation, but again, don't step out of the business role, you know, and make it personal. Perfect. Place a positive spin on your message. What, from your perspective, is the best way to do that? You um, try... As, uh, uh, you know, in a situation where you're winning, you know, in the negotiation or making progress is a better phrase. You're making progress in the negotiation. Um, you, if you walked into that and you had a clear understanding of who was going to gain the greater value, you know, as a result of the negotiation, then you should be in a very good position to point out the positive, you know, in this for the other party. Absolutely. And this is probably my favorite one. Don't engage in the cycle of attack, defend. And yet whenever you're dealing with the unreasonable or the lying people, that typically is a cycle that needs to be broken during the negotiation, in my experience. Um, yeah, you bring up again, of course, the most difficult situation. The um, it requires discipline, especially if they're in continuous attack mode, um, and you know the attacks could become personal. But it requires a lot of discipline to stick to the business. You know, going back to bullet number three here, you know, on the slide, and C, you know, just if you continue to plod that course, see if you actually fatigue the other side so the attacks die down. Yeah, what you don't want to do, you know, we've said this a few times already just dealing with these bullets. What you don't want to do is no matter what the other side is trying to do to you, you don't want to step out of the business role, you know, so stick to the business and don't get personal with the other side. Um, if you get a very unreasonable person, you know, they're going to get personal. You know, they're going to use anger. They're going to use volume. And you just stick to the business. So with that, Bruce, I think we'll turn the floor back over to Catherine to see if there are any questions. Thank you so much. That was a really fantastic and really fascinating uh, presentation. So thank you so much. We do have a few questions. So the first one is, what are some important general takeaways that you have learned from various types of negotiations? First, you know, I never, I never really had, you know, formal courses or trainings in negotiation. Um, you just find yourself thrust into it, you know, with no warning. All of a sudden you realize, you know, you're negotiating. So, you know, I'm a I'm a very inquisitive person naturally, um, and so I try to um, look back, you know, on the different negotiations that I've been involved in. And these, you know, some of these are formal, you know, with big stakes, and others are, you know, smaller um, stakes. Nevertheless, um, you try to you know, frame it, you know, in a way. So what are the lessons that I learned? Um, one of the most important, which we were just, you know, most recently talking about in this um, webinar is the value of sticking to the business, you know, because that's a that's a 100% reliable stance, no matter what the type of negotiation is going to be or the other negotiator. Sticking... Getting yourself disciplined enough, um, it's easy for me today, you know, but I had to learn this, you know, over time. Just stick to the business um, and don't move from that. So essentially, you're going to fatigue, you know, the other side, you know, with their histrionics, you know, or, you know, unreasonable demands. Um, don't move a bit, you know, into the personal. I think that's so, in, yeah, I think that's so interesting to not 
you know, to remember, don't move into the personal for somebody who's a beginner negotiator or someone who hasn't thought about it. No, Catherine, I was just going to say that that was very sage advice. And as an attorney, I get to be the, the blocker, right. For my client. But if something were to involve me, it's imperative that you have someone to advocate for you because it's too personal and it's very hard to divorce the business from the emotion. What is usually negotiated when a cyber attack occurs and with whom? So as Bruce and I discussed and he raised with the colonial pipeline situation, there are a multitude of persons that you will be negotiating with in the event of a ransomware attack. The first is at times the government for a settlement for the breach. It could be the other injured party or parties. It could be the cyber criminal with the assistance of the government. Again, I would not ever advise anyone, including myself, to do that alone. You could be negotiating with your lawyer, your insurance company, or uh, other business associates or subcontractors if you're in the healthcare arena. Bruce, is there anything else that you would like to add to that? No, I think you covered that pretty well. With, um, with something like a cyber attack, you know, I, I'm not going to repeat what Rachel said. There are a multitude of parties that you have to deal with. All right. Here's a here's a great question. What are your most utilized techniques, classic or new, when approaching negotiations in healthcare or cybersecurity or uh, the crossover of both? We mentioned two of them, and the one is known as extreme positioning. So that high ball, low ball. And the other one is known as anchoring. Bruce, is there anything, those are the two most common that I have seen in my business and legal career? Those, those are um, among the most common. I'm trying, while I'm talking, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Bruce, have you ever had a scenario where the focus wasn't on the liability? One side says, hey, we screwed up and we're going to pay for it. So I don't know if you're necessarily anchoring or high ball, low balling, but in your experience, have you dealt with that situation where you're dealing more with the opportunity cost side of the equation? Um, no, you know, there is. It, with a liability, uh, you know, I have been in um, few situations involving that and many more situations involving cost, you know, or price for something, you know. So in a situation like that, it is, you know, it's definitely high ball, low ball, um, probably the most frequent tactic. Okay, very good. This next question is uh, is pretty interesting here. Uh, they're all interesting, of course, but um, this is about the emotional component of negotiations. So one often reads about the mental component of negotiations, whether it's reverse psychology or feigning boredom, appealing to emotions, false demands, uh, being genuine or genuineness, good cop or bad cop, or bullying techniques. What is your perspective and what has your reaction been to negotiating opposite to unreasonable people versus people who are genuine and reasonable? I've always thought that I read people pretty well and fairly fast, you know, and I think I think that's a talent. I don't know um, how I picked it up. Um, my father was a clinical psychologist. You know, and he talked a lot about his business over the dinner table, you know, when we were little kids. So that might have been part of it. Um, so it comes, I think it comes fairly easily to me. That is complemented by, um, it never went beyond um, secondary school, but um Three years in a row, I won the best actor award, you know, in um, interclass competition, play competition. So it is, 
it's easy for me to put on a completely different face. And I try to choose the proper face based on that very fast initial reading, you know, of the person sitting on the other side of the table. That's, you know, in a situation where I don't know the person, you know, and um, that person walks in, you know, to the negotiation. If it's an ongoing negotiation, you know, like a, a contract, you know, an involved contract that is taking place, you know, over, you know, a couple week period to go through um, all the things that need to be negotiated. Um, of course, you get to know the person you know, you're dealing with. You're usually dealing with the same person. So you have adapted, you know, to the person. That's, that's how I react. You know, I have pulled out the proper version of Bruce, you know, to get the maximum I'm going to be able to get, you know, from this person. Do either one of you have any final thoughts for us um, or any other advice that you've thought of? The only other advice that I would impart is to go in to any negotiation centered. And once you're centered, I think that that's very helpful in keeping one's emotions under control. And I often use or tell my clients to use meditative breathing, which can be very helpful, especially when dealing with difficult and unreasonable individuals. Bruce? This is harder for me to use currently um, because, you know, even though we're a tiny company, you know, I'm the chief executive officer, which is inconvenient, you know, in certain negotiations. But um, what I do use is the fact that we're a tiny company, you know, because we're usually negotiating with gigantic, you know, uh, multi-billion dollar companies, um, even though we're so tiny. So what I um, do, you know, I guess this is kind of a little bit of role playing, is if you're getting to know the person you're going to be negotiating with, and that's generally the case, you know, it's never, um, it, in recent years, it's never been you know, here's the schedule, sit down, you sit down and negotiate something, and then you're done. You know, it's a, you're building a relationship, um, and that's going on in the background, but you definitely are going to be negotiating some very serious things. And so what I try to do, it's kind of instinctive, is um, give the person, the, the other person, the impression that I'm rather naive you know, and simple minded. And this is all new to me. Um, and it usually works pretty well. That's great advice. And I think it's great advice also for both of you, you both were saying, you know, either take, take on a role or uh, center yourself, think and thinking about that ahead of time and going through that. As, as I said, a lot of these are um, not you know, single instant events, you know, so, right. you know, you consummate a relationship. The purpose of the relationship is to negotiate, you know, a particular thing, but, you know, it's not something that takes place all at once. And that, that's fun. You know, I like that, you know, because um, you are essentially, you know, studying the evidence, you know, and, I'm um, watching everything that transpires, you know, over, let's say, you know, a two or three week period. Um, and it makes it, you know, it, it makes it fun. I enjoy that. Well, I think we we need to wrap up. So I wanted to say thank you so much for being here today. And so we had the we have your contact information on the slides. Attendees, please remember you can download the slides uh, right from your screen there. Um, so, Rachel and Bruce, thank you again so much for being here today. It's been my pleasure. Likewise, Catherine, always a pleasure to collaborate with First Healthcare Compliance. Yes, thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure, too. Attendees, so please use the, the information uh, that you would find in the slides there. Please send us questions, um, and we'll forward them on as well. Please remember your PACOM and PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You can register for future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com 
or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.